I know it's uh, some of you are wondering what about the book of Revelation and uh, I haven't forgotten about it it's just that we've had so much coming up of special days starting with Mother's Day and Father's Day and anniversary and so it's been tough in those special days to keep the continuity going so what I've done is tabled it temporarily and uh, now that all these special occasions are over with we'll get back to it but I just wanted to let you know that uh, we will be back in Revelation chapter 9 very very soon just not today and what I'm wondering uh, if I can get you to do is I'm wondering if as we get into the Word of God we never want to take this moment lightly or unadvisedly um, this is our life this is our spiritual sustenance being in the Word of God so I'm wondering if you'll take your blue songbook and turn to page 113 and if you sing the first and last verse of this song as your personal prayer to God in the name of Jesus um, just one last chance to prepare yourself to receive from the word and to see it uh, in the importance of what it is um, it's actually the bread of life amen amen so when you say we go ahead and stand as you're standing it's great to see um, Andrew's aunt Maria here with us today so nice to see her and we want to thank Josh for the first time ever because Janine is the way he had to click the slides for the songs first time ever so we thank him for that so the first and the last of 113 and you're singing this as your prayer unto the Lord break thou the bread of life Dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, beyond the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord, my spirit has for thee. God 
is addressed as Father? You know how we pray our Father? You will not find one prayer in the Old Testament where God is addressed as Father. As a matter of fact, in Jewish literature, this idea of addressing God as Father isn't even seen until the 10th century. But getting back to the Bible, not David's prayers, not Solomon's prayers, not Jeremiah's prayer, not John, Jonah's prayer, not Daniel's prayer, not Nehemiah's prayer. None of them address God as Father. But we fast forward to the New Testament, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And when Jesus taught the Lord's Prayer to his disciples, he instructed them to pray how? Our Father. What a privilege. What a privilege for us that the Lord would teach us to pray that way. And we talk about this teaching happening when he gave his Sermon on the Mount. It's important for us to sort of fit this in into the chronology of Jesus' three-year public ministry. The Sermon on the Mount didn't come till his second year of public ministry. And what was he doing at the time when he taught us to pray our Father? He was organizing his kingdom. In the second year, at this point, when he gave the Sermon on the Mount... He was in the process of organizing his kingdom. So it's incredible to think that one of the first things Jesus did as he organized his kingdom is that he taught us to address God as Father. What did this mean? This meant that this kingdom that he was founding would be about a father-child relationship. What about Christ's kingdom? What would be that dynamic of being in his kingdom? There would be a relationship as us being children to God being our father. That is one of the main things that the kingdom is all about. So always remember that. If Jesus didn't teach us to pray this way during his first year of ministry, it was during his second year of ministry, at this pivotal moment, when he was calling his apostles and getting the kingdom set in motion in a very organized way. So, a father-child relationship. Furthermore, what this means is something I found in Isby that I want to quote to you. And, you know, it's cool to use acronyms, right? It makes you sound like you're really in the know. <laughs> Isby stands for International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. And we who are pastors, we refer to it as Isby. And it reminds me of Elise when she went to work for ABWE, which is an acronym. She started learning a hundred different acronyms. And when Pam and I would talk to her, she would rattle them off. And it was like she was speaking a different language. But that's what happens when you're, you're in the know, is you get to use acronyms. So that's ISBE. But uh, this quote concerning the fatherhood of God from ISBE, this shows that the ultimate goal of men's relation to Christ is that through him they should come to a relation with the Father like his relation both to the Father and to them. The goal of this idea of praying our Father, this goal of being in the kingdom is this relationship, having the relationship that Jesus had to the Father being our relationship to the Father. So, 
it comes down to this, wherein father, son, and believers form a social unity. That is how benevolent God is to us, that when he teaches us to pray our father, it's the idea that with Jesus Christ, we form a social unity. And we see that in the other Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 6 is the Lord's model prayer. John chapter 17 is his high priestly prayer. So we can refer to both as the Lord's Prayer. But on the eve of Jesus' Christ's crucifixion, what did he say concerning this incredible social unity that was planned for us with him and the Father? Well, he says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. And look at this. I am them and you and me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them. What? As you have loved me. As you have loved me. <clears throat> so when we pray our Father, this indicates that God loves us as he loves his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, it's important to dwell on this matter today because with Jesus being the more concrete image in our understanding, and it's only natural that he would be because of his incarnation, he came to this world, he's this historical figure, and of course, so much of the New Testament details his life, and so it's very, very easy with him being the concrete image in our knowledge of God, in our understanding, that we can overlook the strength of relationship that we are intended to have with the Father and miss out on the supernatural joy that comes of having that strength of relationship with the Father. Does everybody understand what I mean? Again, we can have it so easy to better understand the person of Christ than the person of the Father. And in an intimacy, we can tend to maybe um, direct so much intimacy with the Son that we miss out on this relationship with the Father that brings us such supernatural joy. And which is, again, according to the Lord's high priestly prayer, his desire for us. He says that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. What kind of intimacy does Jesus want us to have with the Father that we will come to a sense that the love that the Father has for Jesus Christ, he has also for us. And if we don't focus on that relationship with the Father, we will miss out on the spiritual dynamics of that truth that is so transforming in our lives and, and is so freeing as we live out our days on planet Earth. So I want to spend time today focusing on God the Father. Our songs today focused a lot on God the Son. And in our message today, we want to focus on God the Father. And I can't think of a better book to go to for this focus than Ephesians. And if you want to turn there to the book of Ephesians, if you're using the church Bible, it's page 863. And Paul is going to show us in this survey that we're going to do of the epistle, he's going to show us Four actions that we need 
to enhance our relationship with the Father. Four actions that we need to enhance and vitalize our relationship with the Father. The first one is found in verse number three. The Apostle Paul begins the epistle by saying, Blessed be who? The name of God and Father. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now put your index finger under that word blessed. Okay? Blessed means all praise to. So Paul starts his epistle this way, saying, All praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Where does all praise need to be directed to in Paul's mind? The God the Father. The God, God the Father. Exactly. <laughs> Look at the rest of the verse. Who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in what? Love. There it is, this idea of love. It's a relationship of love, spiritual love, that we would be before him in love, having predestinated us unto the what? Adoption. Adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Why? According to the good pleasure of his will. So here again, this kingdom dynamic is he has adopted us as children by Jesus Christ to himself. Why do we give him all praise? Because he has adopted us to himself. And we try and find some reason why he would want us for all eternity. Especially when we look back and see the sin that we committed against him. We scratch our heads even though they don't itch and say, why, why would God do this? Why would he adopt us to himself? And we see the only reason is it's because it's according to the good pleasure of his will. Now think about that for a moment. Why? Because he wanted to. He predestinated it according to the good pleasure of his will. Let me give you a less formal translation. As a matter of fact, read it with me right now. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. God predestinated it or decided in advance that this is the way all of creation would be consummated. Is that we would be adopted to himself and... This is what he wanted. That's the only explanation we can give. It's what God wanted. That's how much he loves us. It's what he wanted, and it gives him great pleasure to do that for us, even though we are sinners. So before the world ever began, God in his nature of love wanted you and me. The, the, the strength of that is... Is, is almost beyond comprehension, but we need to think about it. That's what he wanted. And it reminds me of an April Fool's Day prank that Pam pulled on me when we first got married. <laughs> it was our first April Fool's Day together. And she, she gave a good one. I admire her for it. Uh, she told me, guess what, I'm pregnant. And it was a good joke, but I was working nights, and I had lost track of time and days, and I forgot that it was April Fool's Day, and I took her seriously because what I wanted more than anything else at that point was to have a child. So my heart began to beat fast, 
And I felt, you know, the blood pulsating. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want, that's what I want. And then she told me April Fool's. <laughs> and, you know, it kind of upset me back then, but I think it was a good one. You know, it was, the problem was with me. So anyway, uh, it's, it's just incredible. And we need to realize, as we look at this order in the kingdom that allows us to say our Father, we need to realize what the order is in this, in this um, social unity. It's the Father, the only begotten Son, and adopted children. Now we are joint heirs with the only begotten Son, but he is distinct, as Mark Fetter would point out in our Bible studies, he is distinct as the only begotten. The monogenes. The monogenes. The only begotten. But we are sons and daughters of God. So it is the Father, the only begotten Son, and it is us as adopted children. It's important that we realize this because Jesus, even though he taught us to pray our Father, he never addressed the Father as <coughs> our Father. He always addressed the Father uniquely as my Father and made a distinction that the rest of us refer to him as our Father. Uh, we can see this if you turn to John chapter 20 and find verse number 17. This is page 799. Keep your finger in Ephesians and turn there, if you will. John chapter 20. This distinction is always made by the Lord Jesus. After his resurrection, verse number 17, John 20, he said, Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto what? My father and what? Your father. And to my God and your God. So a little footnote there. That distinction is always made. We all say our father. And Jesus addresses him exclusively as my father. Just a little something to keep in mind. <coughs> So back to Ephesians chapter 1. We've seen in verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he had made us accepted in the beloved. So we're seeing this is all God's initiative. He has chosen us. He has made us accepted in the beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So what we need to see, first of all, in the four actions that we need to do to enhance our relationship with the Father. Maybe we can get Andrew to go back. I don't think I highlighted this yet. Go back all the way. Yeah, right there. All right, next one. This one? There we go. All right, so first of all, the first action is to enhance our relationship with the Father, just like Paul, he started with, blessed be all praise to God the Father. We need to what? We need to confidently praise him for what he has done. And Paul followed in verses uh, 3 through 7, naming all that the Father has done for us. So Paul was focused on what the Father had done for us. And that's how he started the epistle. But then we go on into chapter 1, and we go to verse number 15. 
And Paul says this, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that who? The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. And so his prayer, his prayer, his prayer is to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. So that second action is we need to confidently pray to him for what he can do. We praise him for what he has done, but we enter into his presence confidently praying, not just praising, not just praising for what he has done, but praying for what he can do. An amplified translation of this says this, I always pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. All right? So there is where that prayer goes, the emphasis on the person of the Father. And then he talks about what he expects the Father to do. Um, look at verse number 17 through verse number 20. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. So God wants to do some powerful things in our life. And we need to look for him for what he can do for us as believers. Verse 17, he can give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So many people complain, I can't understand the Bible. Yeah. Well, if that's your issue, where do you need to go for help? Go to the Lord. Say, God, I need you to give me, just as Paul said here, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Furthermore, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. God, I need you. I'm your child. Our Father in heaven, enlighten me. My understanding needs to be enlightened so that I may know what is the hope of your calling and the riches of glory of the inheritance in the saints. And verse 19, that I can experience the greatness of this power to us word who believe. You see all of these things. And Paul repeats this action in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. We see it again if you turn there. We're talking about confidently praying to him for what he can do in our lives. And we see in verse 14 of chapter 3, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul again, talking about praying to the Father. And here he says, basically, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. Now we need to have, we need to grow into such an intimate relationship with God that when we think about all that he's done and think about what he can do, that we're actually touched with emotions, that it actually affects our body language. I would feel badly if anybody in this auditorium ever lived out their Christian life and had never been so moved by the love of God the Father that it didn't cause you, like Paul, to fall to your knees and express. Oh, I mean, this, this ought to be something that is standard operating procedure to us, that we are so touched 
that were so emotionally gripped by this God and Father that allows us to be his children that we can't help but do what Paul did. Paul said he fell to his knees. I bowed the knee. It ought to be more than just sitting in a chair praying. Sometimes if we really realize we need to fall to our knees. Amen. Next, we see that not only do we need to confidently praise him for what he has done and confidently pray to him for what he can do, but we need to com confidently testify of his greatness. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. We need to testify of the greatness of his love. Look at verses 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy for his what? Great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Do you realize the miracle of salvation? The miracle of salvation is that we were dead in trespasses and sins, but in the power of God's grace, he quickened us. What does it mean to quicken us? What does it mean to be saved? It means to be quickened. It means that God made you spiritually alive. God has regenerated you by the Holy Spirit. He's made you born again. That's what regeneration means. How come salvation is the grace of God? Because only God can do what he does. Only God can quicken someone who is dead in trespasses and sins and make them alive. Now, if we can ever get over that, I don't think we've ever experienced it. You can't get over this. This is salvation. It's the outworking of God's great love wherewith he loved us that even, verse 5, when we we're dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Which reminds me of a very poignant statement that I think all of us need to remember. You need to remember this. Jesus did not come into the world to make bad people good. Jesus did not come into the world to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Amen. That's the power of salvation. Many people misunderstand that. Now let's look at verses 6 through 9. Chapter 2. And have raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Remember we're talking about this social unity of the kingdom. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. So this other action is testif confidently testifying of his greatness, the greatness of his love, Paul talked about. But Paul also talks about the greatness of his being. Turn to chapter 4 and find verse number 4. Paul says, there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And then he finishes it off with this thought. One what? God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. He confidently testifies of the greatness of God's being. He says this one God and Father of all is above all. This speaks of God's transcendence and his unshared sovereignty. This one who allows us to call him Father is above all. Now when we think of this word transcendence, 
Transcend means to be prior to, beyond, and above the universe or material existence. God is above all of that. He has unshared sovereignty, but yet he loves us. But yet he's adopted us. But yet he allows us to call him Father. So he is above all and through all, which means that in this miracle and greatness of his being, he's not just transcendent, but he's imminent. What does that mean? Being within the limit of possible experience or knowledge. So this is like you can't explain God. He's above all. Okay, I got that. But he's through all. So he's untouchable, but yet he's present. And that's what this mixture of transcendence and imminence is. They're big words, but they're a reality. They seem paradoxical, but that's the greatness of God. He can't be explained. Even though he's above all, he's through all. And Paul ends the idea of his greatness by saying, and in you all. This speaks of his indwelling presence of believers, his personal relationship, his intimacy with his redeemed, his adopted. The one God rules over all, works through all, and dwells in all. And that's why when we understand this, we realize as his children, we are never forsaken or alone. Amen. Any situation that we go through, no matter how daunting it is, we need to remember Ephesians 4, 6. This is the testimony that we need to take with us in uncertain times. The greatness of God's being. That he's through all and in us all, he is near. We are not forsaken. We are not alone. We are his child. We are a member of his kingdom. These things give us supernatural joy. The problem is, is so often we're blinded to it. So often we're oblivious to this stuff. And that's why every now and then we need to take time like we are today to focus on the person of God the Father. Because that's exactly what Paul did in this epistle to the Ephesians. Which brings us to our last action. We praise him. We pray to him. We testify of him constantly and confidently. But we also do this. Ephesians 5.1. Be ye therefore followers of who? God. God as what? Dear children. We come for a full circle. Be followers of God. This next and last action is we need to confidently imitate him as well-beloved children. God has done all of this for us and all he asks as a result of adopting us is now that he has made us his children that we do what all children should do of a father that they admire and trust in. All children who admire a father that they admire and trust in should imitate the character of the father. And that's all God asks of us as we survey chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. Paul comes to chapter 5 and says, after I've said all this, you need to confidently imitate him. As children. Be ye followers of God as dear children. Look at verse number 2 through 8. And walk in love. As Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God. A sweet smelling savor or aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. Let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. As children, we want to imitate God to that point where Jesus said, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven, which is perfect. We need to get to the point as we imitate him that these sins listed in verse 3, that they be not once 
named among us as is fitting of saints. That's what become a saints means, what is fitting of God's children. Verse 4, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, not necessary, unnecessary use of our, our mouth, but rather giving of thanks. That's much more useful and productive. Amen. For this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So we see this constant crossover of kingdom, children, relationship. And Paul is juxtaposing us with those who are outside the kingdom who are not adopted. Let no man deceive you with vain words, empty words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Amen. Contradistinction of children. We're to be followers, imitators of God as dear children, but there are children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, verse 7. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as what? Children of the light. Children of light. So I want you this week to make a date with God the Father. And now that we've done this overview, I want you to sit down and in one sitting, Read the entire epistle of Ephesians and see that Paul wanted to rub off on us and how he wanted to rub off on us is to make us just as intimate with the Father as we are the Son. And so he was exemplifying to us his actions. He confidently praised the Father. He confidently prayed to the Father. He testified of the Father. And he imitated the Father. He was focusing, focusing, focusing. If he was going to pray our Father, he was going to focus on developing this intimacy with the one he called Father. Now, all of us who have been parents, we realize that one of the greatest frustrations we have with being a parent is wondering if our children ever really realize how much we love them. Because if they realize how much we love them, they would trust us. And sometimes they're not very trusting. And we have to go back and say, okay, so what is the problem here? And the problem is, is they really don't get how much we love them. Yeah. And that's a frustration. And I believe that this is a frustration that the Father has with us. That many people who are Christians will live their whole life on earth never really comprehending, never really enjoying the depths of the love that God has for us. And therefore, they have a problem trusting God. They never get to that place of imitating Him as dear children. Understanding the love we have for our child is his or her best stability against the peer pressure of the world that wants to remove them from our influence. What is it that will keep a child attentive and dialed in to the influence of a parent is when they realize that the parent loves them more than their peers love them. Amen. And they repel from the influence of the peers that seek to influence them away from the parents because they become convinced of this love. And that's where we need to be. We live in a mean world. We live in a world that is looking for not unity, but
but uniformity and conformity. And it's getting really, 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 really intense. It's getting really, really bad. The one world, liberal world order is breaking out right before our very eyes and they want conformity and that conformity is pressure to pull you away from the influence of your Heavenly Father. And the way that we stabilize ourselves against that is we come to the conclusion of how much God loves us and we keep on growing deeper and deeper in this love relationship with Him as we pray, Our Father. I'm going to ask you to turn to your bulletins and my sister is going to read the little article in the bulletin. Jackie Phil gave me this great devotional for my birthday by Billy Graham. And this is one of the entries in that devotional, but it kind of parallels or harmonizes with what we've talked about today. So my sister's going to read that for us before we wrap up today. The Bible reveals God as a person. All through the Bible, it says God loves, God saves, God does. A person is one who feels, thinks, wishes, desires, and has all the expressions of personality. Here on earth, we confine personality to the body. Our finite minds cannot envision personality that is not manifested through flesh and bones. We know that our own personalities will not always be clothed in the bodies that we now inhabit. We know that at the moment of death, our personalities will leave our bodies and go on to the destinations that await them. We know all this, yet it is difficult for us to accept it. What a revelation if we could all realize that personality does not have to be identified for physical being. God is not bound by a body, yet he is a person. He feels, he thinks, he loves, he forgives, he sympathizes with the problems and sorrows that we face. How blessed we are that we can know God personally. And let's stand and turn to page 309 in our songbook. The world is trying to pull us away. If you sang a prayer to start the message, I want you to sing a prayer to wrap up the message. Page 309. Yeah. 
receive the word that has been given today from the Holy Scriptures. And we pray, Father, as the Lord Jesus wants this for us, to know that you love us as you love him. May we, with renewed vigor, be hard after you, Father, to get to this place of appreciating better and enjoying experientially the profoundness of your love. Thank you, Father, for the book of Ephesians that gives us the reality. Thank you for each one here who has heard it. And now, Lord, may we indulge ourselves. May we indulge ourselves in you like never before as we wait for Jesus' coming and that day when he brings us forever into your presence to never be hindered again in fully knowing your glory and experiencing your great love. Lord, this is what we want, and we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 tracks. Every waitress that deserves your tip deserves your track. <laughs> 